All right, everyone, uh, this is going to be our last lecture session uh, with the grad students. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our next two speakers, John Dean and Nick Glinos. Uh, John works uh, in our group, but he's going to be talking about the, the data and the incredible study uh, performed uh, in the laboratory of Gimo Borjigan. Uh, he's a graduate student in the Department of Physiology. And similarly, Nick is a PhD student in the Department of Pharmacology, also working under GMO, and you're going to hear about uh, DMT. So, welcome. Okay, so thanks, George. Uh, much appreciated for the day and for all your mentorship. And Obviously, so now I'll take the time also to thank Gmo and uh, Dr. Strassman as well and everybody on this study. So if you hopefully got a chance to see Dr. Strassman's interesting talk on uh, psychedelics as potentially super placebos. So, but anyhow, so I'm going to get into uh, a topic that we haven't covered yet today. Um, so Chris's data he was showing you um, was on the idea of exogenous administration of DMT. So he also explained to you that it's a psychedelic that's found in plants, but Interestingly, and the topic of uh, this manuscript was that it's found in mammals as well, and including humans. So these data are looking at that occurrence and trying to figure out exactly why that is. So I'm going to jump into it. Uh, so when I was an undergrad in, in chemistry, was, was, I was what I was studying, this is the, the thing that got me interested in this topic initially. When I saw the striking chemical similarity in the backbone, between serotonin or 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, and N-N-dimethyltryptamine, DNT. So on one hand, uh, as uh, Rick Doblin's talk was uh, suggesting today, so serotonin isn't psychedelic per se. Um, so it's known that MDMA will increase the amount of serotonin, that, uh, the increased serotonergic tone, um, but unlike DMT, it's not necessarily psychedelic. Whereas DMT is a very powerful psychedelic, as Chris was showing you. Um, so we know a lot of things about serotonin. And uh, serotonin is a neurotransmitter. We know it's produced in many areas in, in mammals, including brainstem, pineal gland, and also in the gut. Uh, whereas with DMT, uh, we don't really know where it's produced or if it's produced. So it's been identified in trace amounts in several mammalian tissues, including in the brain, the blood, the urine, and the cerebral spinal fluid. And then if we look at serotonin, it has an established role in several brain processes as a neurotransmitter. Whereas DMT, scientifically speaking, we have no currently defined endogenous role for DMT. Um, so whereas serotonin, we know it's involved in several things, uh, the etiology of depression, mood, perception, memory, circadian rhythms, and things of this nature. Whereas with DMT, we're, we're not quite sure endogenously. There are some uh, more mundane properties of exogenous administration of DMT, aside from the powerful psychedelic effects. And these include antidepressant, antihypoxic, and plasticity promoting actions that have been demonstrated in certain studies. So I want to walk through the endogenous DMT biosynthetic pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's known that, <clears throat> excuse me, the amino acid, dietary amino acid tryptophan, is converted to tryptamine via the action of this enzyme aromatic L amino acid decarboxylase, or AADC. So this is an enzyme that's known to have distribution widely throughout the brain, and it's also involved in the serotonin synthesis biopathway. Uh, so the other enzyme, INMT, or indole-ethylamine and methyltransferase, is the enzyme that converts tryptamine to DMT via two subsequent methylation reactions. So this has been demonstrated many, many times. Uh, this research all sort of started in the early 60s and in the 70s, where it was shown that tryptamine, uh, the, the, you could take tryptamine, you could put it into mammalian tissues like postmortem rat lung, et cetera, radiolabel it, and you would get uh, a radiolabeled dimethyltryptamine product. Uh, and then the enzyme was eventually uh, cloned, uh, so the gene, INMT, was cloned, and then the enzyme was purified. And this is just a biochemical way of saying that this is certainly an enzyme that can do this. So we know it's this enzyme and not one of the several other enzymes that will be in the tissue if you're just incubating it with tryptamine. So 
the same authors, this was Thompson et al., then began to ask the question, where in the body is INMT distributed? Where, where is it expressed? So the INMT gene, they did a study in several human tissues, and they found very high expression of the mRNA in the heart, the lung, and the adrenal gland. However, no appreciable expression in the brain, as you can see in the red here. So this is northern blot analysis. So for uh, the, the layman interpretation of this, this is a, a rather crude technique, but nonetheless, it, it establishes in these bands, the intensity of the band correlates to the intensity of the expression of the gene, more or less. So in a more recent study in 2011, Cozy et al. used a, a more sensitive technique uh, and, and applied what's known as an antibody against the INMT protein, so the, the protein that will make DMT. And they actually identified expression of this in the rhesus macaque pineal gland. So for the first time showing that INMT in the green here is present in the mammalian brain. Um, so these data were intriguing to our group. Um, in 2013, uh, GMO showed, uh, along with Rick Strassman and Steve Barker, that there is DMT in the, li uh, the living rat pineal gland via a technique I'm going to explain a little bit more. So this leads us to our knowledge gap, and one of the big questions is, is DMT actively biosynthesized in mammals, and if so, where in the body? Uh, one can make the argument that, that these trace amounts of DMT are merely a serotonin biosynthesis metabolite or something of this nature. And then the second question is, do these endogenous levels, these trace levels that have been previously identified, do they reach physiologically pertinent concentrations? So those are the two questions that we set out to at least shed a little bit of light on with our study. And what we wanted to do is investigate the gene expression of not only INMT, but also AADC. And we wanted to do this with a newer technique called in situ hybridization, which I'll outline. And we, we did this in rat and in human brain tissue. So rather than just look for one of the, the genes necessary for DMT biosynthesis, we look for both of the known genes that are, are required with the logic that this is going to increase the likelihood if we can identify these two genes in the same cells or in the same tissue area as the DMT is being produced in those tissues. Um, and then the other one was to actually quantify the extracellular concentrations in the living rat brain. So the very first thing, like I said, we set out with this technique mRNA and C2 hybridization. Uh, so just a quick refresher, uh, the, the dogma, the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA from the nucleus, RNA, transcription, translation into protein. So we're looking at the mRNA uh, for INMT and AADC. And we did it with this technique that allows us to, rather than grind up whole, uh, homogenize whole tissue sections like the northern blot, we could actually section um, individual brain areas or individual very micron thin slices um, of a particular area in the brain or in the periphery. And then we can apply these very sensitive probes and do this series of amplification steps and then get this colored product that is based on this anti-mRNA probe against the exact known um, base pair alignment for INMT and ADC. And then we get these uh, pink or green dots, as you will see. Um, so these are the data. Uh, this is the, the very first set of experiments we did where we identified uh, INMT in both the rat and the human brain. Uh, so uh, up here on the left side is, is all rat, and we found uh, with the, you can see the black arrows there are positive for INMT. The pink, you can take the overall intensity of the stain is to be semi-quantitative for the amount of mRNA that's present or the amount of gene expression for the DMT biosynthetic enzyme. And this is the rat visual cortex. And then we also looked in the human medial prefrontal cortex. <coughs> Uh, as you can see, the pineal gland in the rat was extremely, had extremely high expression for INMT, and then also in the human pineal gland. And then lastly, we identified it in the choroid plexus. This is an area of uh, cerebral spinal fluid biosynthesis where DMT has been found in humans. Uh, so then we moved on to do a co-localization in the rat tissue for both genes, INMT and ADC. And we saw very high expression of both of those genes in cortical brain cells here in the rat visual cortex. So the black arrows are sh denoting um, in the little blown up images here a neuron that's double or, or a brain cell that is double positive for both ADC and INMT. And then the same goes for the hippocampus, an area that's very instrumental in learning and memory. And then also the pineal gland and again in the choroid plexus. So all four of these tissues suggesting this co-localization um, makes DMT synthesis therein, in theory, a very reasonable possibility. 
Uh, so then we looked at these tissues uh, in the periphery, and these are the same tissues from the Thompson study we wanted to run. And um, we found largely non-overlapping expression of the two genes. And again, these are individual cells, so we're down at the cellular level here. Um, and then area A is going to be cortex, whereas area B is going to be medulla. So really the only area where we saw an overlap of the two genes in the periphery was a slight in, in the adrenal medulla, suggesting that that might be a possible site of DNT synthesis. Whereas in the kidney, we saw uh, these re inverse patterns of staining in the cortex versus um, the uh, medulla for, on one hand, AADC, and then on the other hand, INMT. And then, just like in the Thompson study, we found very high expression of INMT in the lung and in the heart. However, as you can see, there was no appreciable AADC expression in any of these tissues. Um, so then, based on our finding of high expression of both of the DMT biosynthetic genes in the visual cortex and the pineal gland. We looked uh, at the DMT concentrations therein with a probe in rat brain um, up here in the right-hand corner. Uh, so this probe in a prior study, it's inserted through the visual cortex and the pineal gland. And in that study in 2013, uh, GMO's lab was able to identify DMT. Uh, but with this study, as you can see where the probe is, it's unclear whether it's an entirely pineal identified event, biosynthesis, or if it can be, DMT can be, contrib contribution of DMT can come from the surrounding visual cortex tissue. So in this study, we repeated this, but we removed the pineal gland to test for the overall contribution of the pineal to DMT. Um, and then I'll be brief with this um, HPLC method that we use. It's an analytical chemistry technique based on like dissolves like. Um, so the animals are hooked up to a continuous perfusion of artificial cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which then will pump actually the brain dialysate into a column, and the, the compounds will stick based on their polarity, and you can identify a compound of interest by passing a standard amount of a known, in, of a known amount, in our case, DMT and serotonin. Um, and then we also uh, did this study pre- and post-cardiac arrest based on 2015 publication also from GMO's lab, showing that a select uh, increase in neurotransmission in the dying brain was found. And so uh, two neurotransmitters that I selected from this study are glutamate and also serotonin. And we looked in, in that study in the frontal and the visual cortex. You could see a very high increase of serotonin and a, a significant increase in glutamate. So we reasoned that if DMT um, is regulated in any way, shape, or form, that we would anticipate also seeing an increase or something to that effect. Uh, so these are those data. Um, so this is a chromatogram, so that means that this is one screenshot of one animal uh, for this microdialysis technique. So on the, the red here is the cardiac arrest trace, and the blue is the baseline. So these, this time frame is not an experimental time frame. It, it's merely the time that the analytes come off of the column, DMT and serotonin. Um, so the way we did this was we sampled a 15 to 30 minute epics, and so we took three stable averages. Well, we averaged three stable time points two hours prior to cardiac arrest, and then up to one hour uh, within cardiac arrest, we looked at the highest DMT point. And as you can see, we have a significant increase here quantified in uh, DMT from baseline uh, to cardiac arrest. So then we repeated this study uh, with the pinealectomized animals. And uh, even without the pineal gland, we still saw a baseline trace of DMT. And then when the cardiac arrest was induced, we also still saw a significant increase in DMT in the dying brain. Uh, so this very last slide is sort of, in my opinion, one of the more striking findings. Uh, so we actually went in and quantified the extracellular concentrations of DMT relative to serotonin. So um, on the left here, the far left, we're looking just at the, the baseline condition. And you can see that uh, whether or not the pineal gland was intact, there was still a DMT baseline. And uh, it didn't significantly alter when we ran some statistical analysis on it. Uh, at cardiac arrest, something very similar. We, we still saw a significant increase in DMT. Uh, but there was no difference between how high that increase was with or without pineal gland. And then the very last uh, piece of data here is, like I said, in my opinion, the most interesting. Um, we compared the baseline levels of DMT in the pinealectomized animals um, to serotonin. And when we quantified 
what we found was that although serotonin was higher, about double, uh, twofold higher, the DMT was still present in the animal concentrations in the appreciable range of serotonin and also for other known monoamine neurotransmitters, including norepinephrine and dopamine. So uh, DMT averaged 1.02 nanomolars at baseline. Um, and then these are actually from a, a different group of studies, not ours, but just showing you that both our serotonin concentration and our DMT concentration are in the range of what's known for this type of study um, for microdialysis literature. Uh, so one thing that you can look at, and, and we speculate upon this a little bit in the paper discussion, is that why would removing the pineal gland that has a very high concentration of these enzymes not alter DMT synthesis? Um, so we, we explained that a little bit in there. It's uh, one, one possibility is that the, the biosynthetic pathway actually favors serotonin synthesis in the pineal gland rather than DMT synthesis. And the enzymatic kinetic data does, in fact, support that. Um, or, I mean, this was right on the edge. It was p-value of 0 0.05. And the astute eye would say, well, pineal DMT actually increased. Or, well, so, excuse me, DMT actually increased in the area where the probe was when the pineal was removed, almost double-fold. Um, so it could be some sort of comp compensatory mechanism when you remove the pineal gland like that. Um, so in summary, uh, we answered some of these questions a little bit or at least shed some light on them. Uh, is DMT biosynthesized and where? So co-localization of INT and ADC in the, in the rat brain rather than in the periphery suggests that these areas, including visual cortex, are very likely sites of DMT biosynthesis. And then we also found INT mRNA in the human brain, suggesting that it could be a possibility this is occurring in humans as well. And then the quantitative data, uh, do endogenous DMT levels reach physiologically pertinent concentrations? Uh, we did, in fact, find them in the range of known monoamine neurotransmitters, and that, that they did significantly increase up to 11-fold following cardiac arrest. And then DMT was still detectable in the rat visual cortex following removal of the pineal gland, um, and that there's no other way to conclude anything other than the pineal gland is, at the very least, not necessary for DMT synthesis for, of endogenous DMT. Um, so with that, uh, I would just like to, I've been thanking George a million times today. I'll, I'll thank him again, and then Gmo for just being an amazing mentor and giving me the opportunity to work on this project, and then my dissertation committee and, and all the graduate students today that have helped organize everything, and especially the administrative staff who's been nothing short of amazing too, um, and those are a couple of the people that were involved in that. So uh, Nick is going to come up and take you to the next step of what's going to be going on with this type of research. And then we'll both come up and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you for your time. Great. Uh, so Hey everybody, my name is uh, Nick Galinos. I'm a second year PhD student in Molecular and Integrative Physiology, and I'm currently working in the labs of Drs. Gimo Borsigan and Michael Wong. And I first want to give a big thanks to John um, for a great presentation and also for uh, completing this study and uh, basically carving the path for the work that I'm currently doing and the work that I propose to do in the next several years uh, for my PhD. So um, I'm in my second year, so I'm still kind of developing my Nick, thesis. Can you just speak oh, mic sorry. Sorry. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm in my second year of my PhD, so I'm still developing my thesis and my project. So I want to give a little bit of a, of a historical overview and talk about the future directions that we plan to go with this. Uh, and the title of my talk is Endogenous DMT, What Do We Know and Where Are We Going? So I'll start with what we know, and um, that has already been covered multiple times today. Um, you know, Chris has shown uh, in great detail, uh, talked about some of the psychedelic effects of, of DMT. We know that it produces strong hallucinatory phenomena as well as um, profound consciousness altering effects. Uh, and we also know that DMT is naturally produced by mammals. Uh, it's, it's been shown in humans, rats, and rabbits in several different uh, tissues and fluids using a variety of different techniques. Um, and uh, it's, it's been documented uh, for several decades that it's, that it's uh, endogenously produced by, by mammals. Um, and in addition to that, we know uh, quite a bit about the details of the biosynthetic pathway of DMT in mammals. 
and obviously John just went over this, but I can just cover it quickly. We know that um, DMT, the synthesis of DMT starts with the amino acid uh, tryptophan, which uh, we obtain readily from uh, multiple different food sources. Uh, and tryptophan is decarboxylated to produce tryptamine. Um, and then tryptamine undergoes a double methylation step to produce dimethyltryptamine. And one of the interesting things that, um, one thing that I also find interesting that John touched on is the similarity between uh, the structure of DMT and serotonin. And in addition to uh, structural similarities, uh, there's also a similarity in the, in the biosynthetic pathway. Serotonin is also synthesized from the starting compound tryptophan, and it also shares the uh, enzyme AEDC, which is necessary for its synthesis. Um, and the difference is that uh, for DMT synthesis, the key enzyme is INMT, which highlights the significance of John's work that he just presented. Um, and in addition to this similarity of biosynthetic pathway, uh, the metabolism of these two compounds are also, are also very similar, and they're metabolized by, uh, largely by monoamine oxidase A. And one of the challenges of DMT research over the last several decades has been to detect it endogenously, and that's because of its, it's really rapidly metabolized by this enzyme in, in mammals. Uh, so that's been a challenge to, to get accurate detections of, of the, the levels of DMT in mammals. So now just to go over a, a brief history of of DMT, how we, how we came to learn about it and where we are today. So uh, in Western science, we've actually known about DMT for uh, several years. It was first uh, discovered and synthesized in 1931 by the British chemist Richard Mansky. Uh, this was part of a wave of chemical exploration um, and he basically synthesized the compound DMT and didn't really explore anything about its pharmacological or hallucinogenic properties and kind of set it aside and didn't give it any more attention. And it wasn't until uh, about 25 years later when uh, the Hungarian chemist Steven Sara revisited DMT and found that it uh, did indeed have hallucinogenic properties. Uh, and he found this by first administering it to himself um, and then going on to be the first person in Western science to administer pure DMT to, uh, to human subjects. Uh, and then obviously, as I just mentioned, um, it was found, DMT was found to be endogenous in humans and other mammals, um, other animals. And this uh, was a really interesting finding uh, after ha having known the fact that DMT is hallucinogenic. Uh, the idea that humans and animals have a potentially hallucinogenic compound that's naturally produced in their body uh, sparked a lot of different ideas of what this compound could be doing and what its physiological role may be. Uh, and some of those ideas were that uh, endogenous DMT or other endogenous hallucinogens may have potential links to certain types of psychiatric disease like schizophrenia or dementia or other types of uh, psychotic disorders. Um, but despite the fact that we've known about endogenous DMT for uh, over almost 60 years now, uh, the physiological functions and the way that DMT is regulated endogenously still exists largely in a black box and we have very little information, scientific evidence for, for what its function is. Uh, so this black box, this knowledge gap is basically what is uh, informing my research aims for what I'm currently working on and what I will be doing. Um, and I'll talk about two aims today, but uh, for now I'll just focus on aim one. And that is to uh, basically take John's work to the next step uh, and determine if DMT actually does exist as a neurotransmitter in the, in the mammalian brain. So quickly I'll just review the figure that John showed uh, because it is so important to the, to the work that we're currently doing. Um, so again, he showed uh, that the two enzymes necessary for DMT synthesis, AADC and INMT, are co-localizing in multiple different regions of the rat, of the rat brain. And this, this strongly supports the notion that, that DMT could be synthesized in these brain areas. Uh, and we've gone on over the last several months in, in GMO's lab to show that uh, in addition to the brain areas that John just talked about, we've also seen relatively high co-localization of these two enzymes in the uh, regions of the amygdala, the hypothalamus, uh, the visual cortex, and to a lesser degree, the cerebellum. However, there is a relatively high INMT expression in the cerebellum, uh, more so than some of the other areas that we see, which is, which is interesting. Um, so again, uh, this just supports the notion that DMT is, is potentially being synthesized in these, in these regions of the rat brain. And in addition to that, uh, John also talked about the very important finding that cortical DMT levels uh, are actually comparable to the levels of other known uh, monoamine neurotransmitters in, in, in the rat brain at least. So this table, uh, which was just shown, is a compilation of, of several different rat microdialysis studies measuring the uh, concentrations of the three canonical monoamine neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And when we look at the concentration measured by uh, what uh, John just showed, we see that uh, the concentration of DMT falls well within the range of the, of the other three monoamine neurotransmitters. 
suggesting that uh, DMT in the brain may be contributing to, to cognitive function in some way. Um, so these two facts, the, the fact that the enzymes necessary for DMT synthesis are present in the same cell, and the fact that DMT is present in the brain at physiologically relevant concentrations forms our, uh, one of our hypotheses, and that is that DMT exists as a functional uh, neurotransmitter in the mammalian brain. And if we're going to call a DMT a neurotransmitter, it's important that we define what we mean by a neurotransmitter. And we can use this cartoon diagram of a serotonergic neuron to uh, look at some of the four, or the four important properties of uh, compounds for them to be called a neurotransmitter. So uh, with a serotonergic neuron, uh, as I mentioned, the amino acid tryptophan enters the cell and it undergoes a two-step enzymatic uh, process to, to produce serotonin. And that satisfies the first criteria of a neurotransmitter, is that there's specialized neurons for synthesis. These two enzymes, TPH and AADC, co-localize in the same cell in serotonergic neurons. Uh, and then once that serotonin is produced, it's uh, stored and packaged into vesicles with a specific transporter, VMAT2. And that satisfies the second criteria, is that there's a vesicular storage mechanism in place. Uh, once the serotonin is stored in vesicles, uh, a certain activity can cause those vesicles to exocytose and release the serotonin into the extracellular space, which satisfies the third criteria. There's an activity-dependent release into the extracellular space. And finally, the fourth and final criteria is that there's a plasma membrane transporter present for reuptake of that serotonin. And this is, a, this is a mechanism to recycle the serotonin that's been released and to regulate the, the, uh, the response of serotonin in the synapse. So the obvious question is, uh, does DMT then qualify as a neurotransmitter using these criteria? And um, quickly we can show that uh, it looks like as if yes, there are specialized neurons for synthesis as shown by the research that John has just presented. Uh, and it also looks like uh, based on the cardiac arrest studies, it looks like there may be some sort of activity dependent release into the extracellular space. As we saw a, a highly significant increase in cortical DMT from baseline to cardiac arrest in rats. Uh, it suggests that there may be uh, a physiological mechanism causing DMT to be increased in the, in the extracellular space. So uh, the obvious, uh, the two questions that are left are, is there a vesicular storage mechanism in place? And are there plasma membrane transporters for reuptake in this potential DMT neurotransmitter system? And work by Cozy and others at, at the University of Wisconsin have uh, provided some potential transporters and mechanisms for this, this process. And we're currently investigating some of those as well as others. Um, so some of the ongoing and future studies in regards to this DMT neurotransmitter hypothesis um, are to first uh, carry out pharmacological transport assays to seek out potential transporters for, DM for endogenous DMT storage and reuptake. We want to uh, seek out transporters that have the uh, relatively high enough affinities and uh, presence in the brain to be able to uh, actually transport DMT. Uh, in addition to that, we plan to carry out additional uh, in situ hybridizations and immunohistochemistry studies to uh, use some of these molecular techniques to probe for the localization of those DMT specific transporters in the rat as well as in the human brain. Uh, and that brings me on to uh, aim two of what we're currently working on, and that is uh, to search for functional roles of endogenous DMT in mammals. And uh, as mentioned before, the role of endogenous DMT remains mysterious. Uh, despite the fact that we've known about its presence for over 60 years. And a lot of different hypotheses have been proposed uh, regarding its function, uh, such as DMT may be playing some role in the phenomenon of, of dreaming or the hallucinatory experience that we all have uh, when we go to sleep and we dream, potentially uh, because DMT is a hallucinogen, potentially it is, has some modulatory effect on that, on that experience. Uh, additionally, as uh, shown by Chris and many others, uh, or a few others uh, in the past, there's uh, potential correlations with uh, DMT and the near and the near death experience potentially an endogenous mechanism uh, involving DMT may be uh, playing a role in some of these experiences that people report in in, in near death situations. Um, others have proposed that DMT endogenous DMT may be playing some sort of role in certain types of cre uh, creative or imaginative states. Um, potentially, um, potentially again some some mechanism of, of DMT modulation may be. Uh, producing these states in, in certain individuals. Uh, others have uh, drawn the, or shown correlations between uh, at least exogenous DMT and, and spiritual experiences, and people have proposed uh, maybe potential techniques like meditation or uh, certain um, introspective work may be uh, linked in some way to uh, a potential uh, endogenous DMT neurotransmitter pathway. 
Uh, and, and again, uh, there's also the link to psychiatric disorders uh, such as schizophrenia has been uh, relatively well documented and explored in the past. But the fact is, uh, despite all these different hypotheses and despite all these theories, we have uh, very little, if any, scientific evidence to support or refute any of them. So we're basically in a point where we uh, know almost nothing about the endogenous role of DMT, and uh, there are many different studies and many different projects to take on. So in order to test some of these hypotheses and explore some of these possibilities, uh, we have developed in uh, the Borjigan lab an INMT deficient rat model to study the functions of endogenous DMT. Uh, and this is a common technique in uh, different physiological, uh, when different physiological questions come up, is to, uh, uh, if you want to know the function of a, of a certain compound or a certain protein, you can knock that protein out and find out what happens when it's gone. So with this model, um, we've used uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology to uh, basically delete the INMT enzyme, which effectively should uh, eliminate any possibility of DMT production in, the, in these rats. And we plan to use this animal for a variety of different studies. And I can show here some confirmation of the uh, absence of INMT protein. Uh, here on the left, we're looking at the genetic coding sequence of the INMT gene. And we have the knockout animal in red on top and the wild type uh, just in white on the bottom. And if you look at this yellow box, there's a, a two amino acid uh, deletion uh, causing a frame shift mutation in the translation of the gene and basically uh, Destroying the, destroying the function of the INMT protein. And we can show that with um, what's called a Western blot, which is a method to target protein in, uh, in animals. And we can see that the presence of the green band uh, indicates the presence of INMT. And we see it in the wild type animal, uh, but the green band is absent in the knockout animal, uh, indicating that uh, indeed INMT is non-functional or, or not, not present in this animal. So we've got uh, a variety of uh, ongoing studies that we're currently carrying out with this INMT knockout animal. And uh, a lot of them revolve around the techniques of in vivo microdialysis, which is a technique to probe into certain tissues of uh, animals and measure the uh, neuro neurotransmitter or metabolite or chemical profile of those tissues. And you can do this with freely behaving animals. So uh, the first outcome that we hope to, hope to, hope to find is to provide confirmation that INMT is actually the necessary enzyme for DMT synthesis. Uh, the biosyn biosynthetic pathway has been accepted for several decades, um, but this is the first generation of this INMT knockout animal, and this will provide uh, confirmation that INMT is necessary. Uh, additionally, we uh, plan to compare the levels of other neurotransmitters and metabolites between wild type and knockout rats during different uh, behavioral paradigms. And this may provide some insight into compensatory mechanisms like upper regulation, up, up or down regulation of uh, different pathways or neurotransmitters in the, in the knockout animal. And uh, also we plan to do long -term, uh, measure long-term rhythms of DMT production uh, just in the wild type rats. So that would be taking John's study and doing it for a longer period of time to see if there's any sort of a diurnal or circadian pattern of DMT production in, in normal wild type animals. In addition to microdialysis, we're also uh, currently doing some electroencephalography studies, or EEG studies. And this topic has been introduced previously in, uh, in talks before. Uh, but it's just a uh, measure, it's a way to measure the electrical activity of a brain in a freely behaving animal. And uh, with these techniques, we uh, first plan to compare the sleep-wake cycles of wild type versus knockout rats to determine if uh, DMT is playing any kind of a role in um, modulating or regulating the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, in addition to that, we plan to probe into some of those different stages of the sleep and wake, wake cycle and potentially seek out different EEG phenotypes of the knockout of the knockout rat. And finally, we plan to uh, repeat the cardiac arrest study with uh, this animal that is uh, basically DMT deficient uh, with the INMT knockout animal. Uh, so with that, I can summarize. Uh, we know that DMT is an endogenous mammalian compound and it has psychedelic effects when used as a drug. Uh, but we don't, know very, we don't know very much about the way it's regulated or, or its endogenous function. Um, so currently, we are using molecular tools and genetic knockouts to better understand its role. And with that, I, uh, I want to give a big thanks to uh, Gimo and Michael, uh, my two mentors, uh, as well as all the lab members who have supported this project and helped me, helped me throughout. And also to George for organizing this event and making this happen, and all the other graduate students who have helped in the organization of this uh, event today. And Thank you for your attention. Thank you both for those 
great talks and that really exciting work. While people are coming to the microphone, I'd like to ask, what is known about the enzyme uh, just independently of DMT? Does it have any known function? Uh, there's, there's not really a, a, a single defined function of INMT. It's, it's known to methylate uh, potentially other, other amines endogenously, but um, a specific function ha has, hasn't been determined. And, and while I'm abusing my role as moderator, one other quick question. Has, have you looked at peripheral neurons at all? Or is it just uh, brain or yeah, CNS? Yeah. Okay. Personally, I haven't either. Uh, to build on the INMT question, though, so I mean, it, it's known that uh, it's involved in selenium metabolism, uh, histamine. I mean, methyl tran transferring a methyl group is a very common biological function. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's one thing that we even hypothesize upon in the periphery the fact that it's not co localizing with ADC may mean that it's performing some of those types of functions instead of DMT synthesis in the periphery. Um, so, and another thing I would point out too is the tryptamine is obviously permeable to the cell membrane if you're doing these assays where you're incubating INMT with tryptamine, uh, in, in certain, depending on the assay, but if it's overexpressed in a cell, then yeah. So, you know, if tryptamine were to be in the peripheral tissue, you know, it's possible you could still get DMT. It just makes it less likely since ADC isn't there. Thank you. A question up here? One second. Okay, there we go. So I've actually had this question pretty much the whole thing, but yours seems the most relevant in it. Um, and I know that there's a lot we don't know, so you may not have the answer, and that's fine too. But um, this is just your opinion then. Do you believe the consumption of DMT, whether smoked, ingested, or injected, has any effect on the mammal's natural production or management of naturally occurring DMT? If there is no research, does something comparable when happen when dopamine or serotonin, re does it react in a certain way when it's introduced into the body? I mean, the naturally occurring one? You're asking if uh, the ingestion of DMT can alter the- uh, Natural production. Natural production of, of DMT or other, other neurotransmitters. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't say whether or, not, um, I, whether, whether or not that does. Does anything like that happen with serotonin or dopamine or other neurotransmitters? With, with the ingestion of DMT? With, oh no. If you introduce serotonin or dopamine into your body, um, does it affect your natural production of those, of those neurotransmitters? I, I can't say. So serotonin won't cross the blood-brain barrier. So I suppose if you did another method of administration, like reverse dialysis or something like that. Um, I mean, the DMT question is a fascinating one. It's a very easy study to do. You just In the same context that we did that study, you would administer DMT and then measure to see if the endogenous production changes uh, that's actually a hypothesis that Steve Barker, who is a collaborator on the manuscript, has that there may be some sort of endogenous DMT system that responds to the ingestion of any psychoactive or psychedelic substance, and it may be mediating some of the effects of those compounds. Thank you. Is, is your mic on, just so others can hear? Just and speak loudly into it. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Perfect. Um, so I might have gotten lost in my notes, but um, I just want to ask, did you guys stain for INMT and AADC mRNA in human brain, or was that only rats? Uh, that, that, that was only in rats, and um, I mean, John can talk about that because uh, that was his study, but it was just INMT in the human brain, uh, and then a, the combination, the double in C2 was in, was in rats. Okay. So then, um, could you guys just reiterate um, what we do know about the presence of DMT in the human brain? And then I'm also um, curious if you could speculate on why we see higher amounts in the pineal gland of the uh, rats and monkeys. Higher amounts of, of DMT or INMT? Um, oh, so for the staining of the INMT, um, there was higher expression in the pineal gland. Um, and I believe you guys said it was also the same in monkeys where they also showed higher INMT in the pineal gland as opposed to other brain regions. So I'm just curious if you could speculate on why we might be seeing more INMT in the pineal gland. 
Um, so, all right, let me think. Um, so, it is true that uh, the expression, well, so it, it's, it's interesting because in the brain, you know, again, we're doing these like micron slices um, and you're probing like entire brain areas. Um, so in the pineal, it's very condensed INMT expression. Um, but it is true that it's like very, very highly expressed. Um, you know, I would do those studies and literally as soon as I put the, the last incubation step on, it would turn bright pink, like right in front of my eyes, which is pretty uncommon for that technique. Um, in terms of, so you're asking why if, so if it's, back to the question of why removing the pineal gland didn't impact the presence of DMT, despite the fact that there's a high amount of INMT. If you could speculate on why the pineal gland would have more. Functionally or teleologically, I think is the Rel uh, Related <laughs> yeah. to the other brain regions. Um, I mean, not really. So it, again, it could point to one of those other independent functions, uh, or one of those other DMT synthesis independent functions of INMT. Uh, it has like xenobiotic functions and things of that nature. Um, so it could be something like that. All right, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to move over here now. Yeah, um, how much do we know about uh, the role of endogenous DMT in binding to the sigma-1 receptor and uh, its role in keeping cells alive uh, when deprived from oxygen? And uh, is your research going to be investigating this front? Uh, I, I think that will be an area of investigation for us. And uh, w what we do know about it is that DMT does bind to the sigma-1 receptor. And I think uh, sigma-1 receptor is currently thought to be an orphan receptor. There's not really a known endogenous ligand for that receptor. But I think the studies, mostly by, I think, Fresca and, and others in, in Hungary and, and, and in Europe, have shown that DMT binds to the sigma-1 receptor at relatively low affinities, so you need a really high concentration of DMT to activate these receptors. Um, and it's much higher than what we've seen in uh, our microdialysis studies. So we can't really speak to uh, whether, or not, whether or not DMT is having an endogenous effects with respect to the sigma-1 receptor, but I think it is uh, definitely an area of future research. And just like you said, they, they've, there's some, been some pretty promising results showing that uh, there's, a, there's a hypoxic or a, or a protective effect of hypoxia using DMT with the sigma-1 receptor. So. Yeah, I agree with all that. I'll just add to that, though. I mean, the caveat that it is extracellular in terms of the couple nanomolar concentrations that we're finding. And it's, there's studies that suggest that DMT at the synapse is present in millimolar concentrations, so it's hard to say, you know. It, okay, over here. Yes. The... Um, Near-death experiences that everybody's talked about so far, uh, both of you brought up, but the study was on cardiac arrest on uh, the levels of DMT. Is there a co correlation between the two? It, it, was there a study between both of those uh, near-death experience and cardiac arrest? Yeah, it's definitely a rough correlation, but a, a lot of people who have near-death experiences are cardiac arrest survivors. So they've uh, gone through a, uh, a similar, potentially a similar physiological uh, process as uh, somebody who has a cardiac arrest and, and doesn't survive. So it's, it's sort of a model for near-death experience and uh, in order to totally replicate that in an animal model, it would be a little bit more difficult. Um, so we, we're not claiming that our cardiac arrest studies are replicating the near-death experience. Uh, we're just basically using it to understand the neurobiology of the dying brain. I'll just add to you, I can't remember if my last comment I said DMT was present in millimolar concentrations. If I did, I meant serotonin, but I think I said serotonin, which is for the record. <laughs> that's, that's been observed. Duly noted. Sir. <laughs> I was wondering, what's the significance of studying DMT within rats? I think it's significant because um, it's present in concentrations relative to other neurotransmitters, and we have no idea what its function is. It's got a structure that's really similar to other really important neurotransmitters, and oh, we suspect that uh, a compound that's uh, actively synthesized by mammals and is present at these relevant concentrations would likely have some sort of a function. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at some of the hypotheses related to um, uh, dreams or sleeping or near-death experiences or creativity, 
and they um, that basically excited me to to investigate this this project. Oh, um, so I'm sorry, sir. We're going to have to move on to the next question. Thank you, though. I just wanted to know if there are any plans or intentions to to look at the like various kinds of um, you know. Uh, psychedelic experiences that don't involve in consuming an exogenous chemical and seeing if there is any role in the endogenous DMT production in producing these kinds of experiences. So you mean, can you cite an example? Like, I think I follow For it. example, prolonged sensory deprivation. Right, that's what I thought you meant. Um, well, so I, it's hard. I don't own a lab, so I mean, but I, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to speak for. I mean, those are interesting studies. But you rent one, John, and we're. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure if, if somebody would have the funding, that that's certainly an avenue that is of interest. Yeah, I, I, I could just add to that and say that there, there's, it's because there's so little known. Um, I could think of uh, 20 different studies that we could do. Uh, to expose animals to different types of stress, or to expose humans to different different types of uh, you know meditation practices or, or sensory deprivation, and um, we really just don't know uh, anything about the regulation or the physiological function of endogenous DMT. So it's really a, a, a black box. Over here. No. To consider the idea that perhaps if there was a tissue damage in, say, the kidney or the lung, that that. That, that can release DMT and then go to the brain from like an injury or something like accident deprivation during surgery, something like that. Not not in the brain, but in the organ tissue that then gets perceived as, you know, psychedelic. Uh, I, I think that's been one of the longstanding hypotheses actually is that DMT was uh, is m mainly produced in the periphery, like the lung or the adrenal gland, and it, it somehow uh, it's transported into the brain and activates the brain in some way. And that's that's still uh, a, p a potential mechanism for, for DMT regulation, uh, and you know John showed that we, we don't really see a lot of localization of the two necessary enzymes in the periphery uh, as, as as much as we thought, suggesting that DMT is likely not synthesized uh, maybe as, as as abundantly in those tissues. Uh, but DMT does cross the blood-brain barrier, and there's a there's a there's still a strong possibility that it is synthesized somewhere in the periphery, and that it is getting into the brain or getting into other tissues through circulation. And last question. Comparable, or comparable to psilocybin, how would you say that DMT is like a therapeutic uh, thing? I don't know if I'm really honestly qualified to answer that. I mean, so we're, we're doing a more basic scientific research. I mean, that would be more of a question for like Alan or, or Rick Doblin even, somebody that works more in a therapeutic setting. I, I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but no, 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 I yeah, just, yeah. You can hand the mic over to them. Yeah, by all means. So with everything, I'll just qualify by saying that, you know, I don't know that we have empirical evidence necessarily to say that there is, but I can tell you we just finished a, a large study uh, with approximately 2,600 people who have uh, smoked or vaporized DMT. And of those 2,600 people, almost, I would say, 80 or more percent of them reported uh, the same types of things we see that are psychotherapeutically helpful. They said they had psychologically insightful and mystical experiences. And so I think that there's a, there's a good chance that there's a, uh, something that can be done therapeutically with DMT at high dose in a therapeutic setting. I've also done some research with 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, uh, and I think we're seeing some same patterns of results in terms of the survey data. So, um, yeah, I think short-acting tryptamines have a place in our psychedelic medicine panacea of the future. All right, let's uh, thank our graduate students. Uh, as well as their mentor, Gino, who's been really...